All right, we're live for another episode of Keeping It Real. And today I'm really excited to have Lisa Chinati and um, one of her business associates, Jason Posnick, on the show. And the subject today is how to convert more leads into sales, okay? And Lisa definitely can talk on that. She's an amazing lady and a uh, team leader. And she used to be a part-time agent and then went from eight deals to 82 deals in one year. But we're going to let her come on and talk about that in a minute. My co-host is Frank Klesett. He's the CEO of Viral Marketing. They do database marketing and help agents and brokers get more business from their database. For those of you that may be tuning in for the first time or don't know who I am, my name is Jeff Manson. I'm the founder of Real Geeks, but I'm also a Hawaii real estate and California real estate broker. Hey, Frank, can you let them know if they're just first tuning in, how they can follow this and uh, watch all past episodes Absolutely. and subscribe to see the future ones. I also want to uh, say hello to our little bird who has seemed to join us. In oh, in the background. Yeah, there's a bird in my yard. Sorry, he's uh, tweaking. He's, he, and He's making himself known. It's okay. All right. So, yeah. No, it's great. So, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, we've been doing this for a while. Uh, go to keepingitreal.com. You can see all the shows there. If you put your email address in, um, we'll only update you uh, shows. Uh, that's it. No other emails, just the shows when they come out and the replays. But you can also go to YouTube. That's where we're broadcasting this, obviously, on the Real Geeks uh, channel. We also post on the Real Geeks Facebook page, and you can find it there. But also, if you go to iTunes, we also syndicate it to iTunes, where you can download, download them that way and maybe watch them in the car or something like that. So feel free to subscribe. All right. Did you say subscribe on the YouTube channel? Yes, I did. All right, I was spacing out, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so we have Lisa, and Lisa, um, you're from what, Westford, uh, Massachusetts. Could you share with everybody what market you all um, cover? And I think you expanded recently, or we're going to expand, I'm not sure. Yeah, so we've gone pretty big. So our main office is in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, which is the Merrimack Valley. We uh -huh. cover all of southern New Hampshire, kind of up to Lake Winnipesaukee even, and then anything north of Boston in the northern Boston suburbs, not in Boston itself right now. Nice. So you're, you're, you're expanding quite well. Are you planning on going to uh, Boston itself down the road? or who No, knows? no. I, I like the suburbs. I kind of do one thing and do it really well, right? So I tend right. to, I've got a suburb plan going. So I don't know. That All right, cool. All right. And then, so why don't you share with them um, – We'll, we'll jump in and introduce Jason in a minute, and, and then you can share or he can share what he does on your team and what his role is. But why don't you share with them for the people that have never seen any of the previous Hangouts? Because we've done two previous Hangouts with Lisa, and they're both amazing. So I'd go back to the Keeping It Real website and type in her name in our little search thing, and the ones with her will come up. But um, why don't you share your story about how you went from doing eight deals as part-time agent um, you know, don't spend too much time because we're going to cover a lot of stuff, but yep. go through the progression of um, how you've built your business. Sure. So I kind of started, I got my license for the first time in 2004. I failed, oh. let it expire, got my license back in 2010. From 2010 to 2015, I sold maybe one or two houses a year, part-time, open houses, mm -hmm. and whatever I picked up. 2015, I sold eight houses as I started to get serious. And then 2016, I got really serious. I invested into Real Geeks. I joined up with Zillow and started buying some Zillow leads. I started farming the local community and kind of figured out what it needed to do in order to get serious and sold 82 homes in 2016. And the 82 was really before you built the business. You kind of built, started thinking about building business or getting one or two team members halfway through that? Or how did that look? I hired an assistant in okay. July of that year, and okay. so the was just my production alone. Um, so the 82 was just you. So you went with just an assistant because obviously you're going to do 82 deals. You better get an assistant, or you're going to have a lot. You're not going to have a life. Right. Um, so that first year that you really exploded, you just hired an assistant, invested in an assistant halfway through the year, and you did 82 deals. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And then I started the team for January of 2017. Uh, that was. Uh -huh. my Production hit, and we sold 212 deals. Um, I made some <coughs> as a first-time team leader, imploded the team by mistake, and then started. Uh -huh. And so last year we sold 200 or 326 homes, and this year 300 
you're going to hit 600, which wow. is amazing um, because wow. that's almost 100% yeah. year over year. I know your goal was more than that. It was. I think it was like, it was like 900 or something. It, yeah, it started as 900 to 1,000, and then I, I made I had an accident. I broke my wrist when I fell off my unicycle. I was out for a bit. <laughs> and then my daughter had surgery, so I was out sure. for a bit. Um, oh. And I took my I took my head out of the game a little bit too much. So we won't but, get but you, you You won't hit that, but, what I'm, but from 326 to 600, that's basically 98, 97%, almost 100% year over year. Yeah, and it gets it gets harder and harder just so you know because I built a business real geeks and I've, I've built a real estate business the more production and more transactions or the more revenue you start making as the time goes on it gets harder and harder to have those huge increases and for you to be doing at that level from 326 to 600 100 percent year over year growth is amazing Thank so you. you should you I mean, I'm just like some people I mean going from six to twelve, yeah, 100% year over year. That's pretty easy, right? But going from 326 to 600 is incredible. And you should be very ecstatic of accomplishing that goal. I just want to let you know. Thank you. No, I am. It's very, I, am great. They, they, I admire they, you. You're amazing. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I just want to get that off my chest. Um, so Jason is on your team. So what what role does Jason do? And how, uh, how, did, how has he come into play and being a big part of your team? And Jason is the sales manager for the team. So I think in my first keeping it real, I kind of spoke about one of the big, one of my biggest keys to success is I recognize what I'm good at, but I even better at recognizing what I'm not good at. Sure. And I'm very direct and very blunt on operations. And Jason is warm and fuzzy, super motivational. He is the master of scripts and he can, he works with the agents day to day, probably a little bit more closely I do. I kind of been taking over some of the back end stuff while he's taking the front end stuff. <clears throat> right. All right. So he's your sales manager and train helps you train all the agents. Yeah. And so what do you, what do you think are some of the most important attributes that a sales manager needs to have to be effective at it? Because you said, you know what, I'm not warm and fuzzy. I'm more operational. I'm more blunt. If I'm prospecting, I know you'll you bulldog them and you'll just keep going, going, going until they you know, tell you to leave them alone, die or, or list with you. But um, that's a different type of personality. What are the main things that you look for or do you think are very important that Jason brings to the table that all sales managers should have? Too many to list. So I'm a, that's a short list. Jason has got yeah. the energy of hundred people built into one. Lots of coffee. <laughs> He, he cares not just about the business, but he cares about each and every person. Um, mm -hmm. and the time to get to know them and their individual goals, which is more important than I think we all often realize as team leaders. Uh, and he's got massive sales skills. He's got sales skills that, that Jason's never actually sold a house, but he's sold across industries and the ability to understand sales is key. So, hey Lisa, so, real quick, can we get you a little closer to the mic? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> you happy? All right. Yep. So, go, Jeff. <laughs> so, so, so it's really important to be able to like bond with people, lead them, inspire them, all those things. And yeah. I also think you said that's really important is he can show and lead by example because he's got massive sales skills. So, if your agents need an example or need somebody to get on the phone, I mean, he can get on the phone with them or make show them how to make some calls personally, and he would crush it. Correct. Oh gosh, yeah, both of us do. And that's one of the big things is we'll never ask any agent on the team to do something that both he and I won't do it right alongside them. So if they're right. prospecting, we're prospecting. If they're out on appointments, we'll go out on appointments with them. I think both sure. of us are out more, are more than five to 10 appointments a week, even though neither of us is actually in production. Right, and then so are the salespeople um, then making lists or how do, how do you handle this as far as helping them with the objections that they're coming up with? You tell them, hey, is he in the room helping them handle objections right there on the spot? And then also, are they making lists if he's not around? And then how does that all work with the training? Yeah, I mean, we role play in the office every single day, right? Oh. Like that's just uh -huh. part of our culture. If you're in our office and you have an objection, we're role playing it on the spot. We role play in our weekly sales meeting and we mm -hmm. role play in our weekly listing training. And so it's just, I think it's a natural progression that, it's very rare for an agent to hear an objection on the phone that they haven't necessarily rolled at some point in the office. 
Yeah, I'm a firm believer. Um, when I was selling personally, I role played with a different partner every day of the week in the yeah. morning before I got going. And it's really important because you, you'll have these objections that you may not have ever got or you or that you got, you know, that kind of stumped you. And then that's the beautiful thing about the role playing the next morning or what have you. You can role play those and you can give somebody else that objection, see how they handle it and then discuss it. Correct. Absolutely. Yep. <clears throat> agent to agent on the team, it's different. You know, they could call Jason and get one objection handler and call me and get another one. Yeah. And call Martha and get a third one and call Mandy and get a fourth one. And I think part of it is for each of the agents to kind of figure out what feels best for them, right? Because you can't be me and you can't be Jason and you've got to figure out how to take all of it and put it together to be yourself. Right. So Jason, what do you think is, um, you know, one of the most effective ways of helping agents become better salespeople and be able to handle these objections? I mean, working with them, I mean, what do you really try and key in to hone them or get them to, to, um, to learn the scripts and internalize that so they're not focused about, you know. Yeah. What, yeah. So they're not thinking, because you and I know, and Lisa know, if you're thinking about what you're gonna say next, you're not really listening to them. And the most important thing about helping somebody in sales is being able to listen to what they want and be able to then pull from your experiences and 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 help guide them through this to help them. Yeah, I mean, active listening in any sales industry, right, is the most important thing in, in a sales engagement, right? Because by actively listening, you're gonna keep within conversation, and you only are able to do that if you really know your script. And the only way to really know your script is to role play it, to practice it. So we try not to really drive in a million different scripts to our agents, right? When someone joins the team new, it's LP Mama, the basics, right? What does this letter stand for? How do you ask it? What's the follow-up question? And then the goal is to internalize it, right? To internalize the script, to understand why am I asking these questions and what route am I taking them down, right? And the goal is to look for that reason to book an appointment. Then we want them to memorize it, right? They have to memorize uh -huh. what the letters are. And then last but not least, the most important is you got to personalize it, right? Because like Lisa said, they don't want to meet Jason or Lisa or Jason the realtor. They want to meet Jason freaking positive person who's here to help them. So Correct. really hammering in one script simply, it makes their lives easier. And it's just role playing going on appointments with them and doing a recap after and just talking through things all the time. Right. And do you have the newer ones or even some of the veterans listen in on other agents while they're prospecting and give feedback or, or at least, I mean, how's that work in your office? We do. So we have an open bullpen area in the back. We have some quiet prospecting rooms and you'll often find that there's two or three of them in each of the quiet prospecting rooms. And then in the bullpen, everybody can hear. But more than that, we're actually recording some of our calls so that uh -huh. we can actually listen back to it with the agent as part of a coaching session to say like, hey, what, you know, and we'll have agents come to us and say, hey, can you listen to this call? And what can I have done differently to overcome the objection? Sure. So, so it, it helps to have agents that actually want to learn and grow too, right? I mean, yeah. I think that's a key thing too. If they think, if they're not open to that, I don't think they're the right salespeople for most organizations because if they think that they know it or they're too embarrassed or their ego's too freaking big about worrying about looking bad, because it's not really, I, I think the ego is more of people worried about looking bad versus trying to be cool, right? I think that's the biggest problem with most people's egos. They're worried about looking bad. Um, so that, can you guys speak on that a bit? Yeah, so we're a little bit selective in who we hire. Um, and I know that this this was actually probably one of the toughest things for me to learn as a team leader is that not every agent is the right fit for our team. And that we and we have a culture of prospecting and a you know a, a team mentality. So we're actually kind of screening out for those egos and those kind of things that won't fit in. Um, and we've learned who can be successful based on some personality traits and stuff of who have been successful and are successful on the team, and also those that haven't been, because that's the reality. We've failed with some of our hires, um, and they haven't been successful, but it's partly because Jason and I hired wrong. Right, and it's okay, right? Of course. I, uh, hey, look, I feel more than 20 times a day, and I probably walk into Jason's office at least three times a day and say, I fucked up again. <laughs> and yeah. there never it was I did wrong. Right? Like, that's just... But the biggest part of it is admitting it, seeing it, changing it, and not doing it again, right? Yeah, and, and here's one thing I try to, you know, run our business is, you know, try and hire and find great talent, but quickly when you realize you hired the wrong person, get rid of them as soon as possible. Yes. Don't keep that around. I, I mean, because usually nine 
times out of 10, time's not going to make it better. You know that the person's got the right attitude, right approach, right mannerisms, right ego. You know, are they worried about looking bad and that stuff? And uh, do you take that same approach? Fire slow, fire fast. Yep. Everybody okay. comes on with a 30 day trial period and we tell everybody in the first 30 days, we're both checking each other out, right? And if it's not right fit for either one of us, no hard feelings. Right. It's really important there too, though, is we've never let somebody go because of production, right? I think as a team leader, as a sales manager, you can't just judge your sales people based on production. I have somebody doing five units a year, but they're the most positive, collaborative, cooperative person in the fucking op whoop, freaking office. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I'm keeping them, right? But right. if somebody's doing 30 units a year and they're negative, they're slimy, and other people don't trust them, that's where we have issues. I think it's also letting them go for the right reasons, not necessarily yeah. the right reasons for the business. Yeah, I would agree 100%. You can't, just because somebody's doing good production, if they're a cancer, they're a cancer. You got to cut that shit out and get rid of it because some people will, oh yeah, but I think mean, because if you let them get away with that crap, it spreads. It gets bigger. It and spreads. And, and then they're wondering like, oh, why does that, that person gets all the benefits? Because they're doing more production. If they weren't doing the production, that, that just looks bad as leaders, right? Absolutely. Yep. I'm glad you brought that up because that's huge because some people go, well, we got to step around this person because they're doing so much and no, get rid of them. And if they got an attitude, they're not helping your culture. They got to go. Yep. All right, cool. Um, do you have anything else you want to uh, do on that? We can get back into more training and stuff like that. What I'd like to maybe ask is, you know, how do you follow up with your different lead sources? You know, that, like maybe your main three lead sources. I know you got online, you got probably referrals and for, I don't, what are your three main lead sources that your agents are doing? And then can you walk us through how you follow up with those cadence kind of Absolutely. Yeah. So actually just, this was actually my activity this week as I dug into CPE and, and we were really looking at year to date, what are our biggest lead sources and where's, where are we getting the most profit from? Right. So, um, <coughs> realtor.com, Facebook and Google pay-per-click would be our main uh -huh. lead. It lumped all into internet, right? Uh -huh. Open houses would be our second biggest right now. And sphere of influence would be our third biggest at the moment. Profit isn't quite the same. It doesn't fall in that same order, but that's where the, the majority of our deals are coming from in those three, right? Okay, so the online included Realtor.com, Zillow, and all them, and um, right. Google AdWords, PPC, to your Real Geeks uh, online lean generation, basically all those three. Yeah, so what, Facebook, Instagram, all of that in yeah. online. Yeah, it's all online lead gen. And then, okay, why don't we go through that, and then we'll go through the, uh, what was the second one? Open Oh, open houses. Okay. Yeah. Uh, open, you know why? You know why I blocked out a mental block out? I would never do an open house when I was selling real estate. I was like, Mike Ferry, I'm not doing, I'm not sitting in an open house. I'm a prospect, but all right, it's good. People get business from open houses and there's different ways of doing them. And Absolutely. then it would be sphere, center yeah. of influence. Yeah. I do a COI instead of the SOI because it's easier to say center instead of sphere. You know <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's jump into the online kind of how you follow up. Uh, what you know the initial calls and then cadence whether you get a hold of them or you don't and how you all handle that yeah all right so let's start so the lead comes in right the lead hits our database and it's being assigned to an agent so the agent's going to receive the lead on their phone and the agent's going to actually call and we are holding our agents to a speed to lead of three minutes or less i know when we spoke maybe last year or the year before i had said five minutes uh -huh. and we've actually drilled it down and we want a speed to lead of three minutes or less um, if they call the first time and the consumer doesn't answer, they're to hang up and call right back. No answer, they hang up and call right back. And there's three calls, right, three. There's some really solid stats about the answer rate increasing after the third phone call, right? You see a number the first time that you don't recognize, you're not likely to pick it up. You see the same number twice, you're a little bit more likely to pick it up. But the answer rate is about 80% on the third call. And how does that help with Realtor.com? Right. So, and with realtor.com, for instance, where the lead is sold to multiple agents at the same time, we also want if the, if Jason had beat me to the phone as an agent, right? I want to know that the consumer is going to say, oh my goodness, to Jason, Jason, oh my gosh, my phone has rang three times. Somebody else is buzzing in. It must be really important. Can you hold on a second while I pick up the call? And so we've gotten our agents to have the consumer hang up on the other agent that beat us on our speed to lead. And we're able to book an appointment because of the persistence in that initial period. Right. Nice. 
so, so that's important for realtor.com, Zillow, and yeah. online lean gen. I, I, have to ju- I have to jump in. Mm-hmm. Just calling three times in a row is huge. It's a simple thing you do to, con- but do, do people yeah. yell at you? Like, like why are you call- like, no. give me some of that limiting belief. Because yeah. the agents watching right now are saying, I couldn't do that. And yeah. you're right. You can't do that if you got that m- mental mindset. But let's listen to Lisa. I hear answer. She's going to go okay. over and explain. And this is where it's so important to understand that you have to come from a place of serving the client, right? And if the agent remembers, and this is the biggest thing that we always talk about with our team is this consumer has reached out to us for information, right? They've asked us for help in some way, shape, or form. And if I come at it from a place of wanting to help the consumer get their information, not just selling them a house, but helping them get the information, right? It's so incredibly difficult for somebody to get mad at that. Right, I'm not calling just to be salesy. I'm calling to educate you, to help you, to guide you, and to serve you. Right, I'm not calling to sell you. And if you've got a smile on your face and you know, kind of keep a positive tone, there's no way anybody. I don't think we've ever heard of anyone. Every 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 agent who starts onboarding says that I'm going to get yelled at. I can't do that, guys. The tone of the salesperson dictates the tone of the conversation, the relationship that follows. No matter what they say, whether it's why'd you call me, why'd you call three times, leave me alone. Hey, I apologize for that. I want to make sure I help you as soon as possible. I saw you clicked on one, two, three Main Street. What questions do you have about that property in the process? We had a lead come in at 7:50 one morning. In the inquiry, the lead note said, "Do not call email only." Well, I was in the office, so I wore dollars. Second phone call, she answered. We had a four-minute conversation. The first thing she said was, "I asked you not to call." I said, "Yes, Marilyn, I completely understand that, but I wanted to call you because I want to make sure I can help you to the best of my ability. With an email, I can't really do that." So I saw you were looking to see this property and potentially sell one. Tell me more about that. Done. Book the appointment. No issues ever again. Get that limiting belief out of your head, right? Focus on serving, not selling. You'll be good. Yeah, I agree with that 100% because I think most agents, they're, 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 they're approaching the phone calls like, how can I get this person? How can I get this sale? They're not approaching it with a mindset of like, I really want to help all these people. I'm the best agent. And therefore, I'm going to call them and offer them service. And when they say that or like, yeah, I mean, even on a real estate, any anything, oh, I told you not to call me. The way Jason explained that is perfectly because that's coming from wanting to really help saying, well, I really can't help you that well through an email. The best is so I can. And I also want to I want to respect your time. And I can instead of going back and forth in email, I can find out what you're looking for and how I can help you a lot more efficient and quickly on the phone real quick. And then I'm going to leave you alone and, you know, hopefully be able to help you out. But I want to be, I want to be there to help you. Okay. And if you come from helping and wanting to educate, the problem is too many salespeople are out there is they got commission breath yeah. and they got commission breath and they're trying to just get that sale, get that trick, that person, you know, like the three phone calls, not to trick them, is to get them on the phone so you're the actual agent that can help them. It's not a tricky maneuver. And if they say, hey, why did you call? Why'd you call? And so many times, well, I really wanted to call you because you signed up on my website and my website saved your first search. It may not be what you're looking for. I want to find out what you're looking for. So when do you, you know, what are you looking for? Right. Well, I'm looking. Great. What are you looking for? That way I can help you set up a website. I mean, it's, it's from pure help. It's yeah. not like, how am I going to trick this person or what tricky rip am I going to use to like, <laughs> not that it's just right. like listening to them. And um, anyway, you hit, you hit a chord because I'm big on that. I'm not big on slimy sales tactics. Well, and as an agent though, so agent's biggest issue is consistent follow up, right? Hit a call every day for 10 days or 20 days or whatever by utilizing war dialing, something that's completely in your control as the agent. If you can get them on the phone day one, You just saved yourself 10 days of calling. How many agents watching this don't want to have to call the same person every day for 10 days? War dial is your solution. Yeah, three dials, dial, hang up. How long do you wait? Five seconds, 10 seconds? Immediate. There is no wait. It's hang up and hit the redial button. Okay, hang up. They saw, okay, and then all of a sudden they're calling again and they're going. It's true. It's like when people call two, three times, I'm like, oh, my God, I better get this. Yeah. a lot of times I'm like, uh, I don't know who that is. I'm not going to pick it up because they don't know who it is. It's not showing on their cell phone or whatever. But it is true because I do the same dang thing. People do that to me. If they dial two or three times, I'm like, oh, my God, it must be important. Is it one of my kids or something like that? And then you diffuse the situation and let them know you're there to help. 
And that's why you called a couple. Two, and it three. doesn't also need to be diffused. I wouldn't even say we need to diffuse. 90% of the time, it's like a smooth conversation right away. Sure. Oh. All right, yeah. What's after I know the three dials? That's after the three dials. So, okay, so that's what you do. The first thing, immediate speed to dial within three minutes. And then if they don't pick up, you do the three dial. And then what do you do? If, let's say you don't get a hold of that person. Yeah, so, so let's assume the lead mm -hmm. came in at like 9 a.m., right? So that's mm -hmm. then what's being done is the agent is going in and into Real Geeks and setting up a safe search around mm -hmm. the specific property. So if we knew it was a single family home in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, worth 400,000, we're going to set a safe search family homes in Chelmsford up to 500,000 and get that going. Then that, have, let me clarify that because that's if it's coming off realtor.com or Zillow correct. lead because it's coming in and those leads are automatically dumping into the real geeks. So then they can go in and do a safe search based around the criteria. Hey, Jeff, your earbuds, are, your earbuds are dying, Jeff. Are they? Yeah, you're going in and out. You guys hear him going in and out? Uh, he was okay to me. Okay. Um, hopefully everybody can. All right, maybe it's you, Frank. Maybe you're dying. <laughs> anyway, so, so realtor.com, you do that. You go in and save the first search because the Real Geeks website automatically saves their first search. But go right. ahead. Yeah. If so, it comes off of Facebook, Instagram, or Google, sure. it's automatically okay. saved. Um, so they go in there and do that, save a safe search around the criteria. Correct. And so if it was a Facebook property specific ad, an Instagram property specific ad, Realtor or um, Zillow, then the agent's also going to send a text and saying, hey, I'd love to be able to share with you the exact MLS sheet. Here's your email. And then we enter in whatever the email address was that they entered in. Even though we know it would be correct, it's a way to try to engage with a question that's mm -hmm. offering something of value, i.e. the MLS sheet, to get them to confirm their email address is correct and engage for conversation, right? And the goal of the text with the email address is actually is to get them to engage so that then we know that we have the correct phone number. And the goal of the text is to get a phone call and the goal of the phone call is to get the appointment, right? So awesome. assuming still no engagement in there, um, they let it go for the a couple of hours. And then they call back again around 6 p.m. in an ideal case to try to engage the consumer one more time. Typically after business hours is when we're gonna try again so that we have a higher odds of reaching the consumer sure. before the end of the day. Um, if no contact, then they're going to put them into a 10 days of pain follow-up, which is going to consist of a minimum of 10 phone calls over the course of two days. So one of the biggest things that I think helps us with our success is that we actually don't count text or emails as a contact. So if you tell Jason or I that Hey, I haven't been able to get in touch with, you know, George Smith. And we say, okay, so how have you tried contacting George Smith? And you say, I texted him and I emailed him on days two and five. We're going to say they need to do a job, right? So the only form of contact that counts is a phone call. Um, awesome. And it's tied in with some text messages. But the text, purpose of the text message is always just to get a phone call, right? We're not going to book an appointment through a text message if we can avoid it. We're not going to really engage too far in a text message if we can aim to get the phone call. Um, and so that goes on for at least the first 10 days, preferably at least the first 12 to 14 to mm -hmm. the consumer. Um, after that point, we're then putting them into a longer term follow-up plan, um, which in, is engaged through Mojo, the dialer account and that kind of stuff. Okay, and then let's say you get a hold of them the first day or second day Yep. Um, obviously, I mean, what I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to assume anything because um, maybe we have people that don't know or they're newer agents. So what, what, what's your goal? And then, you know, wh how's that look or, or how's that conversation go? So our goal is always oh. to get an appointment, to learn as much as we can about the consumer. So kind of like Jason alluded to earlier in the video today, we teach the agents a basic LP mama script, right? We want to understand the basics of the consumer with active listening and ultimately book the appointment, whether it's an, a listing appointment or a buyer console, our ultimate goal is to get in front of them face to face because we know when our agents are in front of our consumers face to face, we have a really good close ratio, right? But so getting the appointment is the most important part to is start. Is the first appointment a showing or a console? And yeah, so it's always a console if we can, right? So if the inquiry comes in for 123 Main Street, we're trying to book not just a showing for 123 Main Street, 
But a consult, whether it's at Dunkin' Donuts around 123 Main Street or back in our office or wherever we can get a consult, even if it's meeting the consumer at their current home, so that we're not just door openers, which is this, it, it's salesy, right? We want to be a consultant and understanding what you want and how we can help. And sometimes leveraging our off-market list. We've got 40 off-market listings right now in a, uh -huh. in a market that has super tight inventory. And if we understand what our consumers are looking for, we can sometimes help them by leveraging our off-market opportunities. All right. So, so ultimately, if it's a buyer, um, it's to get a consultation first, to yep. dig and build that relationship, and then determine, get them qualified and all that good stuff with a lender, and then set an appointment to go out and strategically start showing them properties. Correct. Correct? Yeah. <clears throat> now, what if they say they're, they're, not, they're looking to buy something in two to three months? You still try to get that consultation? Absolutely, right? Because it, it, like I said, the, the sooner we can start understanding what the consumer wants and how we can help the consumer and help them accomplish their goals, right? It, it, once we understand their goals, we can help them put in place a plan that's going to help them accomplish it, whether it's connecting with a loan officer or understanding that even if they want to move in three months, we actually kind of need to start looking now based on how tight sure. our inventory is, the time it takes to what if they say six to nine months? You still book a buyer consultation? Absolutely, right? I mean, okay. the sooner we can, you know, get in front of them face to face and have build the rapport and build the connection and prove that we're there with them for the long haul. Again, if they say, "Hey, Jay, I'm not looking for six to nine months. I, why don't you call me back in three months and then maybe we can connect again?" Lisa, I can do that, but my goal really is to help you. And I think by meeting now and kind of going through the entire buying process and what we're going to be doing when the time is right, it'll really set you up for success. What typically works better, weekdays or weekends? You know, I'm not quite sure that I'm ready yet. It's I, I'd like to maybe give it a little bit of thought. How about you call me in eight weeks? Hey, Lisa, I completely understand. And, you know, we could definitely meet in eight weeks. But just out of curiosity, how familiar are you with the buying process? You no, know, I've never bought before. Okay. And what's making you buy now? Well, my lease is ending in six months. Okay. And so there's no reason to rush this appointment to have to teach you the buying process, but I really want to make sure this goes smooth for you and it's as fun as possible. Isn't that what you want? Yes. Awesome, Lisa. And I am available pretty much any time this Saturday morning between 10 and 1. I'd love to have you come into the office in Chelmsford. We can go through the entire buying process and really give you an idea of what you're going to be getting into when the time comes. So I'm super excited to meet you. How does that sound? All right. All right, right, perfect. perfect. And I and I love and I love the tie down. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you want? <laughs> I don't know what a tie down is. <laughs> but people who are looking to buy houses, what do they talk about when they go out with their friends? Buying freaking houses, right? Yep. So even if they're not looking for nine months, if I go there now, they're gonna tell everybody, not only am I looking to buy a house, I met a great agent. And then you can even turn it into referrals and build more business off of it. It's sure no harm in doing it. Yeah, there's no harm in doing it, and you can start building a replacement. The relationship and get referrals and then how many times in your marketplace are a lot of these need to sell a home too because a lot of people say like, they're all buyer leads they're all buyer leads i mean lisa percent of buyers are also sellers Next yes. and how much what was the percentage 50 percent of buyers 50 percent 60 okay but one of the other crazy stats is Something like 80% of consumers will work with the first agent that they connect with. Follow that, right? 80% of buyers will work with the first agent that they connect with. And 60% of those actually need to sell as well. I mean, the, the amount of business that can be turned off of adequately worked buyer leads is insane. Yeah, you can get sellers and referrals and you're probably going to get 80% of them of the ones that you actually get into your office because they're now connecting with you and you're building that rapport and building that trust, correct? Yes, yes, trust and rapport in the relationship. Awesome, so that was the online leads. Now the open house, which I never really did, but so I wanna hear this. Um, so you have agents doing open houses, or how's that look? You know, as far as generating the leads through the open houses, because like I said, I never really worked open houses. I was more of a prospect or expired, you know, FISBO type of guy, cold calls. So how does the, how do you generate those leads through FISBOs? And then how do you work them? So, yeah, so through the open houses, it, our, our kind of plan actually starts with before the open house actually starts. So one of the things that we implemented this year, which really upped our open house game, 
was to start ordering marketing materials in the it's a door hanger with two pictures of the house on it and the friday before we start our open houses we send a group of agents out around every every home around that listing and they're knocking on the doors and they're doing a couple things a they're connecting with the neighbors b they're inviting them to the open house and c they're offering the group in the door. See, there. What, what, I'm sorry, my phone started ringing. We know. Uh, and so they're offering. We're gonna call three times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. So that when they're door knocking, they're making yeah. connections within the neighborhood Correct. themselves as mm -hmm. the area expert, right? Correct. They're inviting them to the open house to okay. build the the base that's coming to the open house. Mm -hmm. and our goal through the door knocking is actually to find other listings, right? Yeah, prospecting. <laughs> hey, we got an open house, three bedroom, two bath over on whatever. I'm curious, when do you plan on moving? Right, exactly. And in a tight inventory market. So then we follow it up, right? So that door knocking happens to invite them to the open house. And has also followed up after the open house when we've had multiple offers and we accepted one. And then we're sending the agents back out to kind of say, hey, now that we've sold this property and we know that we got this amazing price for it, okay. we also know that we have two or three other buyers who weren't able to buy this property. Are you, would you consider selling your home, right? And so sure. we're building up listing inventory around our existing listing. So the other part of it with inviting the neighbors to the open houses is that the neighbors are telling their friends, right? So there's a great, there's another great stat within the industry, maybe mm -hmm. it's not that, but people in neighborhoods want their friends to move into their neighborhoods, right? Because yes. you live near the people that you like. So if I can get in front of the neighbors who have friends and have them invited to the open house, and I've increased my buyer base, right? And I've gotten in front of some additional people. And so I'm getting those there. And then I've just got the normal traffic that I'm driving into the open house through posting it in MLS, through having it appear in Zillow, through having it, you know, seeing the signs as they're driving around town. And so, the open house leads are actually not just those typical buyer leads, right? It's not just the people who walk through the door. And this is a, this was one of the toughest things for us to learn as a team. I think it took us, it took us probably a year to realize that we weren't leveraging open houses the right way. Sure. Um, and so when they come in, we're using open home pro in the house. We actually bought these really slick little iPad stands that we put near the front entry, the iPad cool. slides into it. The listing brochures go underneath it. The consumer can sign in to Open Home Pro. At the end of the day, all the leads are dumped into a CSV and imported into real leads. So the leads are going in there. We're setting them up on a drip campaign. But again, we're not relying on the drip campaign for touches. That's just kind of like a bonus in sure. our opinion. Um, okay. And then the agents are kind of putting them into the same 10 days of pain as if it were an internet lead, right? The key is that that first contact needs to happen the same day as the open house. If the agent isn't making a phone call, like an in-person phone call the same day, the lead is dead. Um, that's, to, that's to the ones coming in and registering in the open house, correct? Correct, yeah, exactly. The neighbors are a little bit different. When we're nurturing the neighbors to become potential sellers, the follow-up is very different. Sure. But the ones that actually sign in, you've got the same day, and if you're not making a connection and really getting in front of them the same day, three other agents have already beat you to it, right? They, most consumers aren't just going out and going into one open house on a Saturday or a Sunday. They're going to two, three, four, five open houses in a weekend. And so it's five different agents, and somebody's going to do the job right and call the same day. And because right. of that, the way that you follow up is super important. So what we've been pushing the agents to do is rather than just sending a text, an email, or a call after the open house, before you even leave the house, send a video text of your yes. pretty face, right? The biggest part of communication is body language, that smile, your hands, your eyes, everything. So by sending a video text in the house still, it's, you remember this house, you remember this face. I had a really good time meeting you. And if this wasn't the one, I'm determined and committed to helping you find the right one, right? So you're telling right. it off the response is so high. And it's, again, it's the same thing. If this isn't the one, I want to help you find the one. And so it's going back to serving and understanding what they're really looking for and how we can help them as opposed to just selling them this one house. Yeah, and I, lo and I love how you're prospecting before and after around the open house. So if I would have been doing that, I might have been doing some open houses, which is pretty great. <laughs> Because I love the prospect, right? I just didn't want to sit in an open house, so I should have I been doing them this way. What the hell was wrong with me? 
What about circle dialing? Yeah, and so we're circle dialing around this as well. So I think one of the one of the things that we just started adding it, it we've kind of been layering on all these strategies throughout the year, and uh -huh. so. After our team meeting on Friday, we've pulled from Mojo's neighborhood records. We dropped mm -hmm. it on the house and pulled all the houses within the neighborhood or within a one mile radius. We load them up into Mojo and we have the agents circle dial through Mojo, inviting them to the open house, talking to them about the new listing and you know going through some different scripts like that. Sure. And again, in order to increase engagement and really help us find more listings. Yeah, and, and the key is not just, in, I want people to understand this too, you're not just inviting them to the open house, you're also digging a little bit deeper, finding out how long they've lived there, when do they plan on moving, where yeah. you know, where'd they move from, if they were to move, where would they go next, yes. and when that, and, and maybe when that might be, you know, those kind of yeah. things. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, cool. So that's really good. Um, I think, should we move on to the center of influence or sphere? or? Okay. He's got a question. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, let's say you have incomplete contact information. The phone number isn't accurate. Any resources you use to find the correct uh, phone numbers? Yeah. But you know what's really cool is you don't always need a phone number. So I know that I've spoken about this before. But so one of our favorites is when you put people, when you put your contacts into real geeks, and this is for any lead source, right? It doesn't have to be an open house or an online lead. If the email address is tied to a social media profile, Facebook Messenger is my favorite one and I do it all day and I do it to the agents and it freaks them out sometimes. But if that consumer has a Facebook profile, you can pull up Facebook Messenger on your phone and you can actually call the consumer. You can make their cell phone ring without actually even having to have a phone number. So Facebook Messenger, if you, mess, if you um, use the little telephone icon in the top, actually works like a telephone. Right, it's a voice. Wow, of that's right. So if you have their email address and it's tied to their Facebook, you can call them on Facebook. Yes, and it rings on their cell phone wherever they are. Lisa, when you have a new agent, I have to ask, and they've never been in direct sales before. Yes. And you teach them to call three times and 10 days of pain and to call them on Facebook. Yes. They have to just be overwhelmed of it. What are you really asking me to do this? I know. But, but it's a part of your culture, and they think this is normal. Yeah, yeah, everybody does it. This is what you do in our office. No, it's great. I, I would say, I would say, Frank, yes, if they were an old agent that had been in the business for 10, 15 years and was trained yeah. differently. But they're trained, I, I would imagine they're getting people that haven't sold real estate, they're just getting in the business, or they're pretty green, or either that or they failed the other way, and now they're open and they see that, correct? Yes. So my favorite story right now, we have a, a brand new agent, Stacy Logan, who's been with us for probably like 90 days. She was a flight attendant with JetBlue. They had never sold anything. And she's been with us 90 days. And if my memory is correct, she's got nine closed and pending units, including three listings in 90 Seven days. Seven this month. Seven closings so, this month alone. So nine closed and pending in 90 days. Correct. And yep. that's because she just did everything you told her to do and was enthusiastic, obviously worked on her skills. She built some skills, but it's the enthusiasm and just saying, all right, run, Forrest, run, and so just cool. did it. Yeah, and she was like, you know what? If you tell me to do it, I've got one chance to make my career in real estate work, and I'm going to do whatever you tell me I need to do to be successful. And like being able to cheer on with her at the end of the day when she's gotten like, you know, another accepted offer when she had her first closing or, and she had a closing today, as a matter of fact, and you know, being able to have those celebrations with somebody who's never sold before coming into this team is amazing. One thing to point out with that, her fourth week on the team, so typically we get new agents into production in four to six weeks, right? Week four is like that hump. That's the law you got to break through and yeah. everything goes through it. They get to week four and they're either killing it or they're like, God, what am I doing wrong? There's no results. She had that. And one day she said, Jason, can we have a minute? We did a one-on-one. -on -one. She was like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I don't know if this is for me. We talked through it. We practiced a little bit. We put a plan in place. No bullshit. Later that day, she booked an appointment, went and showed them a property, wrote an offer, and it's been skyrocketing ever since. Your first 30 to 60 days as a new agent is going to be the hardest. You're going to get that point where you're not seeing the results. Keep going. Do the little activities. Get the little wins, and you'll yield the big results. Yeah, keep going and change your mindset. Stop. Yeah. Don't start saying it's not working. It's like if you know you're following a proven 
way a roadmap or proven track record and other people are doing it and you're working on the skills some people just take longer than others but you got to keep the positive mindset and you it's it's all about the faith because here's the deal when i got in real estate everything's all it was in 92 92 93 gulf war everyone the, the market was crashing everyone's like oh you crazy why are you getting in real estate da, 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 da. oh the market's horrible and i was a title rep for a little bit and i was going around calling on real estate agents and they're saying how horrible the market is and all that but i was listening to mike ferry tapes and listening to tom and all those guys his sons and all that and i'm like what these people are crazy they just got the wrong attitude they're not doing the right things because i was telling them they should be doing these things and they're like oh i couldn't do that whatever so it's just a horrible mindset but I knew if I followed what those guys were saying, because I was seeing all these other agents that were following them. And I knew that if I just did that, I could crush it. And it was a downturning market. It was short sale crazy. It was like two short sale markets ago. And I think I did like 35, 36 deals my first year. And I was only like 23. I was young. I was going on listening like old people's homes and they're like trusting this little 23 year old guy, right? <laughs> Even commercial brokers that were working at uh, Marcus and Milchap, they were in the commercial commercial business and they were experienced commercial guys selling the residential, but they listed with me because I had the belief and confidence and I freaking pounded him. And they were like, yeah, we like you, man. All these other agents are lazy and they're not, they don't have the right attitude. Anyway, sorry about it. I got a little excited. No, I love it. Yeah. The results aren't there yet. Yes. So we got to have the faith. Yep. You got to have the faith and belief that if you keep doing the right things and you do it consistent, consistently, that's what Jason said earlier, most agents are not consistent yeah. and persistent. If you keep up the consistency and the persistency and keep working it day in and day out, it's going to happen. And then you, once you get going, you're not going to have the, you're going to just keep going. You're not going to have the peak and valleys because the problem most agents do, they start having some success. Then they start working on their deal and start, Stop doing what got them there. They got to just, you got to keep doing what, what, what got you there. Don't stop. Right. Consistency closes and allows you to close mm -hmm. consistently. All right. You guys are getting me excited. <laughs> Give me one to go start selling day to day. All right. So that's the um, open house stuff. Is there oh, anything yeah. else? Yes. Yeah, so, huh? so the other part, um, this was to answer Frank's question. So to, you know, when we don't have a great phone number, so some, 90% of the consumers in the world that I know have iPhones these days, right? Like it seems like Apple is ruling the world. And so if you have somebody's email address um, and that email address is tied to their um, Apple account, their iTunes account, iMessage account, whatever it is, you can type the email address into an oh, yeah. iMessage within the Apple iPhone and it comes up as a text message on the consumer's cell phone. So you may not actually be able to complete a voice to voice call but it might get you onto the text messages as opposed to just in an email box, which gets full of spam. Right. So write that down, folks. Say it again. You, so you take the if email. If you don't have the phone number, you take the email. And instead of, you know, when you go to start a, a text message on an Apple phone, yeah. you can type in an email address and then do a text message. And if it's tied, it will actually show up on their phone as a text message. Correct. And so then you can take the video text message and even send the video text message. So not having to do a video email and video text messages are even more effective than a video email and a text text message. So if you can layer all of that together, it again is just another way to try to engage a contact that maybe we don't have the correct phone number for. Okay. Outside of that, we use the white pages, um, app to be able to look up contact information. We use Mojo City Lists and sometimes Remind is another one where we're looking up um, consumer information. Cool. Awesome. All right. Um, so I think that's it or, or mostly on the for sell by owner stuff. I want to keep going. Otherwise, we're going to run out of time. Um, so the next one is the center of influence or sphere. Um, how, how does that look? You know, I, obviously you prospect them and you follow up with them. So how does that whole, how does your center of influence plan and follow up look? So we're still, I'm gonna be completely honest, and I said this last time, good. I've gotten better <laughs> than, than when we last spoke. It's still not where I want it to be, but we're making baby steps to get there. And I actually good. think that that's important for people to realize is that like, 
everything that we do isn't happening overnight, right? And you're not going to be able to take absolutely everything that we talk about today or tomorrow or that we've talked about on these last three hangouts that we've done and think that you can implement it or even that we're implementing it all, all at once, right? Everything that we do is kind of layering it on and doing it slowly, bit by bit, sure. um, but still consistently. So um, what we're doing is we're putting, we're having the agents put their SOI into real deeds, right? Setting up market reports, not as a main point of cut, but it is just one more point sure. of touch that we can plan. Uh, we've been working on an item of value strategy um, and getting the agents to go to top buys, but getting that automated has been my weakness where I've failed to do it as consistently as I need to. But that's definitely on the on the plan or in the plan for what we're going to be able to help our agents accomplish over the next year. Uh, making scheduling follow up within real week so that we've got they've got their SOI or COI broken down into their A level, B level, and C level. And based on whether it's A, B, or C, how many times are we picking up the phone and calling that person or having coffee with that person or stopping by or you know whatever those contacts are and making sure that the follow up plan is scheduled and in place so that. You know, one of the things that we always tell the agents is that we leverage real geeks to let it do the thinking for them, right? So as the agents get busier, you're never going to be able to remember to call Aunt Betty and Aunt Sue. In fact, you're never even going to remember, be able to remember to call all of your leads, forget your SOI. So if you can put the action plans in place and put the workflows in there so that the system is reminding you what to do and when to do and making it so you don't even need to think about it, that's the biggest tool in your arsenal, right? Is actually setting up the follow-up plan and then just letting it think for you and telling you what to do and when to do said activities. All right, so let me ask you, if if somebody hasn't really worked their center of influence or sphere, what would you, you know, if they were gonna put it in the Real Geeks and set them up on um, a market report, how would you call the agent or what would, I mean, not the agent, the prospect, the center of influence, Obviously, you're calling them, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you have to. It, everything has to be personal, right? Like sure. email isn't personal. Text message isn't personal. And the reason that your SOI is your SOI is because they know you and they love you. And this was, this was hard for me to learn. Like I always say this, but for those people who really know me, like I'm not the most crazy outgoing person that there is. <laughs> like I've got this small group of people that I love and that love me. And it's even difficult for me to, to pick up the phone and call them. I'm the sure. one who has to hide behind the text message, but they don't want to see my text. They want to see my face, right? Sure. So one of the things that um, that we do every, probably once a year, and it's super powerful, a small tip. If your whole SOI is within real geeks, you can send a blast email to all of those people. It's two sentences it, uh, with some of the autofill stuff, right? Hi, put in the first name. It's been a long time since we've connected. I'd love to meet you for a cup of coffee. What time and what day and time works for you? And blast that sucker out to your entire database. And the replies come in. And the, it, I drank so much coffee last year. It was interesting. <laughs> I didn't realize awesome. many people actually liked me, which was. <laughs> <laughs> you're likable, Lisa. <laughs> but you're. <laughs> but but you're like me, direct to the point. It's like, hey, you don't like to, you're not warm and fuzzy like Jason, right? <laughs> We're like kind of direct to the point. It's like, let's cut the bullshit. <laughs> let's just get to the point, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's so it's it's good for you. It's good for people like you and I to do that because it helps build our skills, anyways, and helps yeah. us go do something and and connect with people, and it gets easier and easier the more you do, correct? Yeah, and getting out of the office is so important. Like I, and, and I think Jason is the same. We are both two people who could work in this office. Like I could be here 80 hours a week and I love being here. It's harder for me to schedule the time to get out and to go do the interpersonal relationships. But we take in hundreds of thousands of dollars a year from referral business, right? Right. And that referral business doesn't happen because of text messages and emails. And it doesn't even really happen because of phone calls. Referral business happens because we're out getting to know people, whether it's our SOI or other agents. Yeah. And I think a lot of people need to understand that you need to be connecting and having a relationship and coming from help yes. and just connecting with them. Every, too many agents are like, what can I do to, you know, 
what's the magic email plan that's going to give me all this business? That's it's great. I mean, you're, you're going to get some with that, but you're going to get more by reaching out, calling them, meeting them in person and actually talking with them and connecting with them and bringing something of value. Right. And if you have them and, and here's one thing, too, if you put them on the market reports, you can call them every six months, three months or once a year or whatever you're, you're able to do. And you can say, hey, you've been getting those market reports on what's going on in the neighborhood. Do you have any question on what's going on or what you've been receiving? I'm more than happy to, to help you out or let you know what the market's doing going up or down. Just yes. come from contribution and help and then let it go from there. Yes. Right? 100%. 100%. I mean, I think everybody wants to automate everything and automation is great. It helps you organize, helps you stay in touch with people, but you, there's got to be human intervention. These aren't just like leads that aren't human beings. They're human yeah, beings. Right. One huh? of the people always ask, we don't use any auto responders. We don't have any text bots. We're not using Ava or any of those things. Every single thing that we do is human interaction. So, and I, I'm always like amazed when agents like want to go instantly to the AI solutions. I think that there's a place for it in some businesses, but I think that as in general, I think that we're allowing some of that to take over too much of the interaction. Well, and like I think Greg said on the last one, we're letting so much of that take over and so many people do the things that we should be doing. We're losing control and they're selling the, that stuff back at a higher rate. That too. Yeah. Right. That too. It's like, and one of the biggest reasons, and I, you know, I'm probably going to offend a shit ton of people, but a lot of the reasons is because they're freaking lazy and they don't want to freaking pick up the phone and call people. I mean, that's what there's, if you're going to be successful and you want to make a lot of money in this business and you know, you're making a lot of money because you're helping more people. You got to get off your ass, pick up the phone and start taking action and being consistent and persistent. Like Jason said, um, it, I know we're pushing up against the hour. Are there any other like tricks or tips? Not that we're going to trick anybody, but like, let's say, let's, let's get rid of the tricks. Well, XL tricks, any other tips that you would like to share to help them connect with more people? And then maybe we could take a few questions if there's any good ones and we have a few minutes. I don't know how you guys are doing on time. Do you uh, Facebook message them? Are you finding effective at all? Yeah, I mean, if they're not responding, I mean, here's the thing, right? Like, it doesn't matter how we're getting in touch with them as long as we're getting in touch. The Facebook message isn't going to be the only way that we're going to engage with them, but the Facebook message may be how we work to get the phone call, which is how we're going to work to get the appointment, right? And I think one of the biggest things that we can do is just use every tool at our disposal and be different, right? How many people are actually using Facebook Messenger? Not a ton. But it's personal. Heck, I Instagram message people too. I don't care how I have to reach them, right? As long as I'm reaching them. Cool. Awesome. What other tips? Any other little insights on lead conversion? I got these leads. I'm trying to get a hold of them. I'm trying to get them to respond. What, uh, when you're what talking, are we, what, with what them, are we missing? You know? so, so, I, I think part of it is understanding that not everybody is always ready at the same time, but not giving up too soon is one of the keys. So one of the, I think one of the biggest game changers for us this past year was to implement putting everything into a pond account and then having the agents be um, using Mojo or another dialer to dial through those pond account leads, right? Because just because somebody else didn't convert it, say Jason had a conversation with it with a consumer and it wasn't the right fit or his objection handlers didn't handle it the right way, it doesn't mean that that I won't have a different result. Right, I might be just the person that needs to connect with it because we're two different people. We have two different sales styles. We have two different personality styles, um, and being able to understand kind of how that plays in has been huge. But also that we're having great success pulling out Facebook leads that came into our Real Geeks account two years ago, and we're hitting them on the dialer, and all of a sudden we're converting a two-year-old Facebook lead that most people would have assumed was dead, dead. Right. Right. Awesome. So it's not giving up too soon. And then, you know, just on the sales stuff, understanding the personality profile of the person on the other end of the phone and being able to mirror in that speech and being able to understand that you're not going to be able to work with Jason the same way that you're going to be able to work with me as a consumer. Right. If you don't get to my get to your point within 15 seconds with me, I'm probably hanging up the phone. Jason, however, will talk to you for 15 minutes about his dog, house, and all of that other stuff, and I'm never going to do that. But if you as an agent or anybody selling to me can't recognize that, you're never going to be able to work with me. Yeah. I, think, 
really important thing too is that you're not selling houses, right? If you're working with a buyer, you're selling them on your ability to serve them and help them identify the right house and secure it at a price they're comfortable with and at suitable terms in their time frame, right? Because with a seller, you're not convincing them to sell their house. You're proving to them that you are the best person to partner with them in the sale of their house, right? And you change that thought process and once again, kind of shifts you from selling to serving. I'm not selling you a house. I'm proving to you that I'm here to help you and that I can help you find the right house for sellers. Sure. All right. And then Lisa just said something really important. And I'm going to segue into maybe a potential follow up uh, segment if you guys are up to it. Are you all teaching um, your agents how to mirror a match, rate a speech, tonality, inflections when you're doing the role play? Obviously, they got to learn the script before they can focus on that. But yeah. you are teaching them all, uh, all yeah. that stuff. And, you know, we went to a conference this past, uh, in May, we went to a conference and one of the big takeaways that Jason and I was on communication, right? And so we have this really cool activity planned for tomorrow at team meeting. I'm not going to give it all away because half my team is watching this. Sure. But it's really going to dive into how communication styles, me as a driver communicating with Jason as an expressive and Jason as an expressive and how understanding that what I say, like if I say something, I'm saying it in two words and Jason's going to say 15 words, right? And mm -hmm. my saying just two words may not make Jason understand what I'm saying versus him saying 15 words I might clean out after two. And so it's really important that as agents, we understand the consumer and how we need to relate to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, maybe we could do a follow up more in depth, how, you know, going through scripts, but actually how to communicate and um, communicate better with them or something, if you're all up for it. That. That's one of our favorite parts. Cool. All right, cool. Let's wrap That's up, fun. I love that too. All right, well, hey, I wanna thank uh, both Lisa and Jason getting on. I really appreciate all their sharing and they're really coming from contribution. They're not getting paid. They're just um, part of a culture that Lisa's in and Jason's in and that I grew up in, um, you know, back to Mike Ferry and Tom Ferry. I know Lisa's a uh, coach from Tom. Yes. Um, Ferry organization. And that whole culture is like, hey, top producing agents, we don't keep we don't keep this stuff to ourselves. We share with other agents and we give because we know if we give, we're going to ultimately get more back and we're going to learn something as well. So I really appreciate you all coming on and um, with that and actually really trying to help and share um, with all these agents that are watching because we all were there trying to learn, grow, and we're still there trying to learn and grow. And we appreciate when people share with us. So I want to thank you all. I want to thank um, Frank for coming on as always. He's amazing. These would not be possible if it wasn't Frank, but helping and uh, getting us teaming up doing the starting these, I don't know, three, four years ago. Yeah. So I want to thank Frank and we're going to take um, July off because it's around the 4th of July, but we'll be back on in August. So we'll see you then. Thanks. Bye Thanks, now. Everybody. Bye, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye.